Good evening, everybody. Um, well, you, all, you all know me and you all know me and my ugly face. So sitting next to me, I have a less ugly face. I have the wonderful Mathilde Rivo, who uh, is now, it's, it's a very good sort of seamless changeover from uh, the Etienne Griveaux to, uh, to Mathilde Griveaux. I've been mean, working very closely together. Uh, I first knew the wines under Mathieu's grandfather, Jean Griveaux, but Etienne increasingly took charge during the later 1980s. And, and now another page turns, as they say. So most of the wines we're tasting, uh, most of the wines we're going to taste beforehand will have been Mathilde and, um, and her brother Hubert working um, with uh, Etienne. And uh, one or two of the older ones obviously would have been pure Etienne. So, um, quelques mots sur le domaine Grifo? Oui, bien sûr. Good evening, everybody. I am very happy to be here. Um, so, domaine Grifo is located in Vaudromane. Uh, with my brother, we are the sixth generation to take over this family estate. And our first vintage with our dad was in 2010. So, since this vintage, the idea is we do more and more with my brother and our dad does less and less. And it's great because my father has a huge experience. His first vintage was 1982. And we have a very nice relationship together. And he has the experience and we have like the new energy. And we want to go in the same way all together. And we are very lucky because we love exactly the same things. We love the freshness of Pinot Noir. We love the purity. Uh, we love the sophistication. So since 2010, vintage after vintage, we, I think, increase uh, together the, the quality of, uh, of the Gribo wines. Uh, we produce only Pinot Noir grape varieties, 18 different applications, uh, some in Rue Saint-Georges, the biggest part in Von Romane, uh, also one appellation in Chambol-Mizini, village appellation, and Clos-Bougeau, Echezeau, and Richebourg. So what you've managed to put together, put together. Uh, between you is pretty much all the Grimmel through the Grand Cru yeah. vineyard. There are a couple missing, which we'll let us talk about. Um, but otherwise, um, are you happy for us to kick off the first wines? I'm, I think Sebastian will be serving them in pairs. Is that right? Two at a time? Yep. yep. So, so shall we. We're going to get bigger pours than you guys. <laughs> so Beaumont Brulé, uh, I'll talk a bit about the vintage, but first of all, maybe if Mathilde introduces the two vineyards. Uh, Jasper, just to let you know, the wines we have are the Beaumont 15 and the Reno 16. The two that we have. Uh -huh. Okay, right. Uh, in that case, there's a, it hasn't come out. There may be some other differences in order. Well, we don't have the Reno because there is no longer a single bottle left in captivity here. So, uh, so Mathilde you will have to talk lucky. about it. Yeah. <laughs> you are very lucky. You, you have to explain us what is your feeling about uh, this bottle. You know, we, we have a tiny um, appellation of Reno. It's maximum one barrel and a half production. So that's why we don't have enough bottles for us. So please let us know what is your feeling. And um, Reno is a wonderful appellation just located on the top of La Romane Conti and, uh, and La Romane, uh, maybe one of the best Premier Cru in Von Romane. And you have also the Von Romane Premier Cru Les Beaumont, which is maybe one of my best appellations in, uh, in Von Romane because it's, uh, it's always an appellation, very elegant, very sophisticated. And I also always love the distinction in, uh, in this appellation. Uh, it's uh, very precise about the expression of, of the terroir. I have to say, normally when I'm tasting the range here, it's the one that, that sort of catches my eye. Um, sure, you know, Reno is, is more highly thought of, probably Suchot too, but um, uh, Beaumont, Beaumont works for me. So you're going to have to tell us about the Reno. Uh, the vintages, you're familiar with the broad rules about them. Uh, were you frost effective in the Reno? Yes. Yes, we in sixteen we only produce one barrel of uh, of Renew due to the to the frost in uh, in spring. Yes. 
and then 15 a more generous vintage in in every respect yes so um taste a bit more Jasper, we also have now the 15 brulee. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, so Beaumont sort of overlooks brulee. Um, Grivo is very lucky. They got a nice good helping of, of brulee. And I find it one of the most characterful of the Von Romane Premier Cruise because there's a big difference depending on where you are. There's a little road that leads up into the back country out of uh, Von Romane. And once you've taken your eyes off Romanet Saint Vivant and Richbourg on the left, uh, you go up into the hills and then you have Brule on both sides of the road. So you've got one side which is more or less north facing, um, where Jean de Claire Mayo is, for example. And then uh, the Grivos are on the south facing mm -hmm. side, as is Eugenie as well. And, uh, and then you've got, is your Passe Le Beaumont absolutely next door? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they've really redone the wall beautifully there. Um, it's, it puts DRC to shame because they've just redone the wall of, around the new plot of, Riech, of Richborg and it hasn't been done in uh, dry stone walling character. Right, well, so Rainier, you can tell us about it in a minute, but it'd be fascinating to hear your comparisons also between Beaumont and Brulé, and we will give our thoughts. The colour's a little bit lighter in the brulee in our, our bottles. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Brulee is not so good with Pierre Fusé. Mm. A little bit of gun flint in the um, brulee. Otherwise, it's a bit softer, but it's then got this flintiness. Smoky, oh, smoky, flinty. Yes. A long finish too. Mm. Mm. The Beaumont has just got such an energy of fruit. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I'd, I'd put the Beaumont away for quite a while yet. But the Brulee, if need be, I think you could. I think, yeah, yes. I think yes. you can drink. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it sounds as though you're getting similar thoughts. Actually, the aftertaste in that Beaumont is just spectacular. Mm. I came here and tasted once years ago. And Clive Coates had been tasting just before. And as we came in, he came out. He said over his shoulders, very condescendingly, oh, by the way, the Beaumont is the best of them. <laughs> Thanks, Clive. <laughs> um, how is the Rainio 16? <laughs> Can you elect a spokesman for the radio? He's attempting to not carry it. Who's it going to be? Is it going to be Richard? Michael, as our chairman, I'm curious, Jasper, when you started and said it was frost effective, how does that impact the taste of the wine, or does it not? It shouldn't impact on it at all. It can affect sometimes the structure of the wine. I think it impacts the whites more than the reds. Um, my memory of 16 was that they had this incredible freshness and um, sort of compact style at the end, but with an intensity of fruit. And complexity. Yes. Mm. So, so it, there's a bit more, I, I find the Rainier 60 probably, there's just a bit more, I think the vintage comes through, a bit more sort of just sappiness and sweetness of fruit, but the, the vineyard really comes through on the palate with that, the lightness of touch, that really ethereal, uh, very delicate, for me I find it very, very delicate on the palate, but with this sort of very unerring straight line going through. I think it's absolutely superb, like, superb. And the intensity would come from smaller berries because of the weather that year. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the frost doesn't make the berries smaller. It just means there are there are fewer yes, fewer of them. Yes. Um, but um, I mean, it's always a difficult thing when you have a low yield. 
it's sort of easy to say that there's a certain amount of goodness in the ground and because there are fewer grapes to share it amongst they must all get more concentrated but it doesn't necessarily work that way um but it, it 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 does seem to have come out in 2016 and frankly in 2016 we had no hope of a great year uh even on the very eve of the harvest uh all the ripening appeared to be very uneven and suddenly everything caught up and and got itself back together again um and we're now pretty excited about them but um i'm not really starting to drink any so i don't often see them hello i'm gonna i'm gonna ask mathilde to say a little bit more about the 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 two that we have in front of us i'm i'm very happy about the the expression of these two wines um 15 is a very charming vintage and also complex and uh with a huge purity. And I remember just after the bottling time, this vintage, when we opened bottles six months after the bottling, the wines were very glamour, very open and accessible. And after a year, a year and a half of bottle, they were totally closed. And I'm very happy to see now that this vintage start to be drinkable again. And um, it's true that Le Beaumont is very long, very energetic great capacity to age. Uh, we can maybe wait a few more years. And Brulé start to be accessible and drinkable at this time. So it's very good to know that. After those first three, what we should have next would be the 2012 Sushou. Okay. Yeah. Which is yeah. what you have got. After that, we should do the 09 Budo. Then, then the three Grand Cru's Vujo, Eschazo, Richbourg. Okay. Like, that, we won't be, like that, we won't be repeating any vineyards. But first of all, we've got Les Souchots. Um, I have my thoughts on, on Souchot. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna throw one of these away, rats. And so Sucho sits pretty much below Brulé and Beaumont. Um, the very top of Sucho comes and nudges up to Beaumont. Yeah. But it does depend where you are in the Sucho to exactly what style of wine you're going to make. This part. Yeah. Yeah. What is your production of the Brule and the Souchot? You mentioned barrel, barrel and a half for the Reunion. I know the Beaumont is a bigger production for the house. What about the Brule and the Souchot? Beaumont is a bigger production and Brule, uh, when we have a normal production, uh, Brule is five barrels and uh, Les Souchot is four barrels when, when the production four barrels. Awesome. Yeah. So, 700 bottles, 1,000 bottles, 1,200 bottles. 2012 is a vintage that's sort of fallen off the radar a little bit, um, which is a shame because I like it a lot. Uh, hail in um, the Côte de Beaune, not in the Côte de Nuit, though I think still a small crop. Yes. Um, and then um, Sucho, talk about Sucho, Mathilde. Um, Sucho is, we, we are very lucky this evening because Sucho is also a wonderful appellation. I I like to to tell this appellation like my little Richbourg because we can have some similar sensation when we try uh, Sucho and Richbourg because we have the spicy sensation in Sucho. Uh, I love the sophistication in, in this terroir. It's very pure, uh, with a huge sophistication. Um, it's it's a, sometimes a, a little grand cru expression. And I don't know if you all agree, uh, Jasper, but it's... Uh... What I found about Souchot is that it starts really well. You put your nose into it, you get this beautiful fruit, and you're really excited. And then suddenly it seems to disappear on you, and you think, okay, I was expecting a bit more than that. I was expecting more follow through. And you sort of turn around and say something to your neighbor and it, it comes back on you and it, it suddenly rebuilds. And 
the image I get is because this vineyard, in fact, there's a slight dip. If you go from north to south, the, the vines drop into a little valley and come back up the other side. And it sort of does the same thing in its taste profile. Um, so the start and the finish are both superb. And then it just goes a little bit quiet in the middle, uh, which is why it's not a Grand Cru, because it's surrounded by Grand Cru's otherwise um, on, on that sort of contour line. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. 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 The 12s are really late thing, right? And I always thought the 12s are still asleep, but based on that bottle, I think they're re awakened when they're ready. That's pretty well. I think it's beginning to be a time when you can really start looking at 2012s. I agree. Yeah. And it's a good acidic structure. There's a cool window. Super <laughs> off. Still got really good acidity, hasn't it? Yeah, it's that straight line. It's always going around. Just for curious, uh, I remember you mentioning once before not all areas of Susho are equally are, are equal. How, how yes. is it because the lower you are uh, is different to the closer you are to the rich pool, or is the soil different? Is a or is it the elevation? Well, there are two things. I think in, if you're too far down in the dip, you're not going to be very good. And then there is a little patch right at the top. Nowadays, being called Grand Souchot, um, which is perhaps pretty uh, pretty spectacular. Um, but uh, you know, other, otherwise, most of them have the same general profile because normally the rows go. Yes. Once. yes. Norm most people have got rows that start up, start up the Bog side and go down and come back up. Not everybody. If you look at a detailed video map, you can see it's not quite the case for everybody. But that's the general thing. Um, Mathilde was just whispering me a little taste profile. Uh, I'm I'm very happy with uh, this appellation because at the beginning it's it's a very sharp sensation and then um, you can feel that the wine you can taste the wine in different things um, second after second in your mouth the wine is like another story second after second and uh, I'm very happy about the the acidity because at the end of the taste it's very long very energetic um, and also very juicy. And uh, yes, it's. I think you have everything in this wine. It's, it's very complex and uh, with a huge purity. It's a very mm. nice bottle. Oh, that's just cool. I just find the smell slightly off. The bottle is not quite right. It's not bad. But the nose is totally different. Yeah. It's very different. It's very kind of distracted in style. It's very kind of brown. It's quite brown. I don't think we have a perfect bottle this one. Oh, okay. Okay. Our best definitely is because it's got a clarity about it and a clear cut precision that um, that is definitely right. This wine doesn't have that. The other the other two wines just had this all had this kind of purity. Oh, right. Then it sounds like a bottle a bottle variation. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah, Sorry about that. Yeah, I don't like it. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, I actually also like it. Yeah, I, I like it too. Yeah. Is it? Could it be that this is the stylistic change? You know, Mathilde, you you and we've talked about this at length at the, at the domain. Your style of wine making is a little bit different than yeah. yeah. around the extraction. So, uh, do you find that your twelve is stylistically a little bit different to the prior? In your case, two wines, right? Color and nose. Um, it's true that vintage after vintage, we continue to increase our winemaking style. So, vintage after vintage, we, we change few things. And 
I think it's true we, this, the last 10 vintages, we, we continue to make a huge progression. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, there's a really good video about the, I think, 2017 year. Um, can you access it from the site? Uh, soon. There is okay, yes. which will soon appear on the site. Uh, it's in French, but there are some unbelievably good subtitles in English. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously done by a very modest man. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. Anyway. Um, okay, so the, um, the next wines which I suggested uh, as a pair were the Nuit Saint-Georges Boudot 2009 and the Clos Bougeot 2005. Yeah. Just to repeat, the purpose in my ordering was not just to sort of go down in, in straightforward uh, order of vintage, but was to make sure that in the wines that we do in this tasting period, we would see one example of each of the vineyards. Um, and then afterwards, afterwards you have three uh, Premier Cruise 2010 and two 2007, so it could all be accessible. Let's just say you've got your main lining on Richebourg afterwards. Louis Saint Georges Les Boudot. Oh, Boudot, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, I mean, at the domain, this wine is served after quite a few of the Bone Roman Premier Cruise. Um, so, and rightfully so, right on the board. Absolutely, Michael. Spot on. Jasper, you were the first one that put me on to this vineyard. You were always saying that you were very interested to try Malconsort, then Udo, then Merger. Yeah. And then see the evolution as you go across the border. Yeah. This is this is that is wonderful. And the other one that's pretty spectacular in that area is Richmond. But here is oh, I just love the nose of this, don't you? Yeah. Okay, that was kind of funny because you put uh, Michael onto it. <laughs> I've, been, I've been an active buyer in the secondary market. It's changed the market price. You, know, right? <laughs> you really do. You really have this brilliant marriage between a Nuit Saint Georges style and Von Romanet elements together. Um, it's the extra bit of hedonistic, but there's a solid Nuit Saint Georges base to it. I should also. How many barrels, uh, Mathilde, do you make of the Boudot? Um, quite a lot. Yes, qu quite, normally quite a lot, but after the 15 vintage, we decided to replant. Um, Half of uh, of the vineyard. So since uh, 15, we, we produce less than uh, the normal production. But with the full uh, plot, it's uh, 12, 13 barrels in total. Oh, okay, okay. This, this vineyard, this vineyard is a very old. You know, my grandfather Jean. Uh, he's 93 years old, and he never did that. I see. The old part is. Maybe 93 years old or, or maybe more. So um, it's uh, it's a wonderful appellation because uh, Jasper explained us that you, you have the, the expression of the Nuit Saint Georges uh, terroir and also the Von Roman, a little bit the Von Roman style and it's very elegant, but carried by a huge, powerful sensation with the very old vines. We, we have a huge complexity. Um, we could have light fruit sensation. But in 2009, it's very floral. I, I love the nose. Uh, it's very elegant, very pure, very sophisticated. And a few more tannins than any of the uh, Von Romanet wines. Mm -hmm. The other thing about this vineyard, um, Etienne told me, is that they kept breaking their plows when plowing it because there's a bit in the middle where the rock comes right to the surface and uh, rips the plow up. Sort of the other way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't know, Jasper, I don't know whether 
the vintage suited the vineyard, the yeah. vineyard suited the vintage, but it seems to be right. really a very good marriage. It's either well, a whole line and And, you know, I would make it a little great business for the really long time. And, and in fact, some of those tenants will come from 09 as well as coming from recent George. It's also slightly atypical for a lot of new, it can be quite rustic, but this doesn't have that rusticity. I, I think it does, actually. I, I get some of that rusticity. But, but you know, compared to if you think about exactly. an Henri Gouge or 10 other producers, yeah. right? Uh, this, is, this, is, this is far more put together, far more balanced, and really has that high toned red fruit rather than just overpowering you with the black fruit. Yeah, the problem, but no one else has the same tenant because Gouge capture all the tannins. They go out there first and they've caught all the tannins in Misa Georges and they've kept them for their own winery. <laughs> <laughs> not left for anybody else i mean that in a nice way but i mean because they love to make wines which will age 30 40 50 years and did you say this was replanted why was it replanted <gasps> ah um you know in burgundy um when uh, when the food dead we we decided to replant only one when, when it needed and the competition between the old vines and the young vines in the same vineyard is very complicated. And in some very old vineyards like Ogo, the competition was too high for, for the new plant. That's why we, we decided to, to replant a half and not one feet to one feet, feet in the middle of the big um, appellation. So we decided to do this in after the vintage 2015 and we replant half of the, the appellation in 2018. So um, we could start to pick the, the grapes of the new vineyards now. But you won't necessarily put them in the main wine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Mm. Okay. Well, uh, so, I mean, the thing about 09 is it had 2010 alongside it. And 2010 started looking so pretty so early on that everybody transferred their affections to 2010. But 09 is the vin vintage with a muscle for the long term. Good, and alongside that, you've got a powerful individual, Clujo 2005. When um, Frédéric Angerer and the Pinots bought to Ben Angel, uh, Frédéric Angerer said to me, okay, who makes the best Clujo? Um, I want to try and work it out. I want to try and work out which plots are the best. And what I cited, uh, I said, well, obviously Philippe Angel used to. Uh, Angro does, and I think Grivo does. And he said, Grivo can't possibly, their vines are all down at the bottom. Um, so if you look at the map, it's not the best situation, though that's changing with these hot, dry years. The bottom, because it retains water, is getting a lot more interesting than used to be the case. But actually, we then did a big tasting of Clos in Bordeaux during the Bordeaux Primeurs one year that Fred Angerer put together. And the only conclusion we came to was it makes no difference where you are. People who make good wine make the best wine. <laughs> People who are less talented make less good wine. It's true that we are, we are very lucky to have 1.86 hectares of Claude Bougeot uh, in one vineyard. So it's, it's a very long plot with uh, three different kinds of terroir. And it's true that the bottom of our Claude Bougeau, close to the main road. Um, we, we have deeper soil and during the 90s, it's true that we did, we did not obtain the perfect maturity of, of this part of uh, our Claude Bougeau. So my dad always separate this part of our vineyard and uh, sell to negotiant because okay. it, was, it, was not, it was not perfect to, to be a real food And you know- He did that up to wait, up to wait. Um, until maybe the end of the 90s. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's now I think it is very interesting to be in our part of Claude Bougeau because we have three different kinds of terroir, deeper soil to the main road, and the top of our vineyards, close to the Chateau de la Tour. We have less soil, um, dry, very dry soil, and 
due to the dry summer since few vintages, we obtain a better maturity in the bottom of our Claude Bougeot. And since many vintages now, we always blend the grapes uh, yeah. during the fermentation. And the top of our vineyard gives to the cuvee a huge complexity. And the bottom of, uh, the, of the plot gives to the cuvee uh, more harmony. And um, it's true that Claude Bougeot is a big guy with muscles and need a long time aging in bottle. But this O5 with a beautiful vintage in Burgundy, it's very, it start to be accessible. Uh, I like the tannin touch of soaps. I think the fruit uh, profile is accessible. It starts really well. Then you come up against this raft of tannins more than any of the other ones you've had. And then the fruit comes back behind. There's a little menthol character in there as well, which is quite intriguing. Um, the acidity is good. So it's a, it's a super concentrated vintage. I mean, there are some parallels between 2020 and 2005. Um, but frankly, at home, I'm drinking, we just opened a bottle of um, Orgoin Rouge to have a my Penny Bachelor three nights ago. We just had a glass and he put it over three nights. And by the third night, it was getting even better. But even a Bourgogne Rouge is not a to deliver in 05. Um, and so Grand Cru, uh, I, I, I do own some, uh, some Grand Cru still in 05, and I don't think I've even opened a single bottle yet. So keep. But I like the way the food is involved in this. I think that's quite promising. Uh, so this, this bottle comes from the Tour d'Argent. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Jasper, why are the tannins so furry? As, 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 as you said, and something my neighbor mentioned, right? There's a very huge change in tannic profile. That's largely down to the vintage. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think Beaujau is known to have these quite firm tannins anyway, but it's really a vintage thing. Um, it was a little bit too dry. If there's a fault in 2005, it was the slight lack of rule. And there were less into it then than they have become since. Um, it's still, there's so much fruit there that it's all going to resolve in time. Uh, the, the, at the moment, that little raft of tannins is, is a you would get that in other 2005s from um, this domain and from every domain, um, but they won't be as prominent as they are in the Claude Boucher, um because of the vineyard. Um, but what it, why it doesn't worry me is the way that the fruit comes back afterwards and what you're left with, the final impression in your mouth is the fruit. And um, of course, if you're actually eating, uh, you know, a proper a substantial dish, a sort of classic burgundy dish of Beth Bourguignon alongside, then that would take away the tannins uh, in any case. So you possibly could start the vintage alongside that sort of food. It's a vintage that's going to need uh, rich food with sauces rather than something delicate and char grilled. And I, I also think we, the grievous style increase a lot the, the quality of, uh, of the tannin touch. Hmm. No, I think yeah, now, now, we, now, now in our wines, we're, the tannin touch is more voluptuous, uh, smooth, and, and, uh, and delicate, like like a, a velours. And um, velvet. Exactly. Um, maybe if we have to start again to make the O5 vintage, at the end it could be a little bit different yeah. because we, we continue to to make huge progress in our winemaking style. And, um, Can I ask Mathil, what do you do to change the nature of the tannins in your winemaking? Well, what do you do differently? You, you know, we, we always distem everything in our wines, but now since the 2010 vintage, we work with full berries. So we, we try to keep the integrity of the berries and we, we don't crush the berries. We, and I think uh, thanks to have a, a part of full berries in our tank during the alcoholic fermentation, uh, when we want to extract colored tannins, uh, everything is more smooth, more delicate, and um, I don't know. 
But actually, um, uh, just an allied point to this, uh, when the 2020s were coming in, I had a chat with um, Dominique Lafont uh, about his reds, and he said, I'm really going to be careful here because I don't want to extract as much tannin with 2020 as I did with 2005. It was the clear parallel that he, that, that he had in mind, um, which is interesting. Even people of my generation are still learning. I'm just curious, um, Mathilde, um, remember um, Etienne mentioned last time he was in Hong Kong, no stems, but you guys don't use stems. I guess that's still the case today. Still no stems. No, 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 no. no, you know, we no. sometimes we want to try, but yeah. we always find a good reason to <laughs> always use stems. <laughs> Have you ever experimented with stems? No, you know, many, many producers are, are very good with full bunch, uh, but you know, I, I think you, you, need, you need to be very focused on it. And I, need, I think you, it's very important to want to do. And we always find a reason to always just them everything. So we, 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 are, we, we, we know full berries and this is our um, feeling. So I think it's, it's good to continue on, on this way. Yeah. Right. So we have two more wines and I suggest that we probably look at them singly rather than together because. This is okay. They deserve to be looked at one by one. Suchot, and you had a Suchot 12, and now we got the Eshiso 12. Uh, was this, at this point, had you got your extra vineyards? I think, yes. Yes. Lamadon yes. had arrived. Yes. Yeah. It's a deeper color than the Suchot was. Um, yeah. We have a very slightly reductive nose mm -hmm. in ours. I don't know. Whereas the sushi was pure and clear fruit, this has gone into itself a little bit, a bit reductive. So You're really talking to the people who gave me the bottle about provenance and storage. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we can we can throw them out now if you want, Jasper. <laughs> we tried at the start, Adam, but it didn't work. The rich squirrels white. Okay, so let's keep thinking. The RS fruit is now coming up through that reduction, and it's it's heavenly, frankly. Mm. So tell us a bit about where your Eshazo is. Mathieu. Yes, we are very lucky to be located in in Le Cruyo area. It's maybe one of the best parts uh, of the of the Eshazo, and uh, also uh, very old vines. Um, always a wonderful appellation. It's true that our bottle is, is a little bit reduced and um, I, I'm not surprised because Eshozo is, is always a, an appellation with a huge energy and um, inside the bottle 
I have the feeling is that these appellations don't have enough space to to can evolve, and I oh, think I like it, yeah. it needs uh, maybe more times to be perfectly drinkable. But uh, the noise is, is a little bit reduced. But I also love the spicy sensation, and I'm very impressed about the the quality of the um, the taste in the mouth. <laughs> very powerful. Um, also spicy sensation. Very long. <laughs> It's 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 an appellation with a huge complexity, uh, very elegant. Um, I think we again continue to make a, a, a huge evolution with the tannin touch, and in this appellation, is better, better vintage after vintage. Mm. There's a sweetness to the fruit that we've hardly seen before in the other wines. What do you reckon? I love the point of I think it's going to be a little bit of a session of a seashell. Very much fresh. It will be perfectly drinkable, maybe tomorrow. After well, what do you say? I was saying that I, I think having tried the Escher's own now, I think Richie's assessment of the Susha where the bottle was maybe not spot on. Tell that. I think there's much greater freshness. Anything I find Susha is very surprising. Sorry, you find the Susha might be a lot of Susha. It's not a big thing. We don't have any reduction on you don't get the reduction of the extra. Right. 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 The bottle shouldn't be re reduced, but um, there's a greater density of fruit in our bottle compared to the Suchet by actually quite a big yeah. margin. Um, uh, it's fabulous. Uh, a... Jasper, I've always found with Revo Ashes, though, the intensity and fruit profile is actually quite powerful when you then compare it with Primitive Fruit. The same vintage. Yes. Fair to say? Yes. Okay, good. Um, there's a question that we could ask uh, Mathilde this because the family owned their own uh, vineyards in Eschesso. And then in, I think, 2011, but Mathilde will confirm, um, another family in the village called Lamadon retired, <clears throat> retired, and they spread their vineyards between uh, Louis Michel, Le Gébelet, uh, La Marche, and Rivo. And I'm going to ask, did that change the character of your Echezo when you got the extra vineyards? Uh, this extra vineyard is not a, a big one. It's, oh, okay. It maybe represents only 15 or 20 percent of the final curry. So it's not, uh, it's not a big proportion. OK, so not enough to change things. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful wine, and uh, Mathilde said she thought it really needed to be open for 24 hours, and then you get it at its best. We, uh, Jasper, we, bore, we have been served the Richfield 17. Good, okay, that's what we have too. Yes. Our Rich Bogs have a different form of product. It's like having a little bit of a taste on the nose. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Okay, well, pray silence for Mathilde's talk about Rich Okay. Um, as you know, Richbourg is our best grand cru in, in, in the cellar. Um, this appellation is always very interesting to try because um, my dad, and I really agree with him, um, we can try the Richbourg like an iceberg. That means that the, the part you can see is uh, nothing comparing that the biggest part you, you have in the water for the iceberg. And I think Richbourg is similar. 
Um, Rijbour at the beginning could be a little bit introvertized and very shy. Uh, and then minutes after minutes can give you the story and then another one and, and a, a big, big evolution. And it's, um, this appellation is, is always very spicy, sophisticated. And my dad loves to speak about um, oriental uh, sensation. Yes, the souk. The souk, <laughs> exactly. Sure. This appellation is very, always very powerful. Um, it, it's a gentleman. This appellation is a, is a real gentleman. And in addition to this vintage, 2017 is a very charming and elegant uh, vintage. Uh, at the domain, we started again to open a few bottles. We, we opened uh, last week some village appellation in 17. And I was very happy to see the good evolution of, uh, of this uh, very drinkable vintage. Take a little while for me to, to get in into the nose of this wine. You can tell it's a massive beast. Um, Lovely. Yeah. It's a lot there, but it's also approaching. You can start approaching it. Very happy. Very, 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 very balanced. Yeah. yeah. I have to say, when um, a certain friend of ours who, who may easily be in the room with you uh, organized. <laughs> <laughs> a vertical tasting of um, Vivo Richebourg uh, and Etienne very wisely suggested that we should do the tasting from the oldest vintages through to the youngest and then when we'd all tasted them Etienne talked to us through them saying where they had made a technical change where his understanding of what winemaking specifically Richebourg uh, were about how that developed and then he said okay and this year I realized that I needed to find a way to get around this issue, which doesn't please me. And then he said, but two years later, that was the year when I actually found the way to get around it. And so he went through. And so Etienne and Marielle, his wife, were there. Um, uh, Mathilde and Hubert were there. And then at the end of it, this ex extraordinary tasting, wonderful tasting of Richbourgs. And at the end of it, this amazing um, explanation of everything he'd done. Etienne burst into tears. It was such an emotional moment for him. And he'd never, ever done a tasting of that form before. He'd never had the opportunity. So... Before and after. Or, or after, I, or after I, I, I was. Yes. It was an incredi incredible moment. Uh, and we've done some verticals of other producers, uh, Richborg, and not had, not had the same sensations that we got out of that tasting. Thank you, Richard. Yes, thank you, Richard. Great <laughs> yeah, pleasure. It, it stays in my mind that one of the really fabulous tastings that, uh, that we've ever done. So the 17, I mean, it's, it's got room to go, but it's, it's a vintage that you can dive into earlier than most. Mm. So, hmm. The fruit wants the fruit wants to say you can drink me. And the structure still says no. It's, it's too much, too powerful. Good acidity as well as just the right tannins. Um, so you know, it's a shame to drink it now, but but it's not completely unreasonable to give it a try. Mm. And the aftertaste, of course, is, so the, is the longest of all of them. Yeah. <laughs> So, while we have the, the privilege of having uh, Mathilde here, is there anything that you'd like to ask her about the domain where, where, where she may be taking it and uh, anything else, any other thoughts in general or about the wines to come for you this evening? What's, the, what's your most favorite wine you've ever made? Ah, <laughs> that's a very difficult question. <laughs> Favorite child. 
you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it depends on the vintage. Okay. Each vintage, I'm always proud of an appellation. Um, you know, we, we're very lucky because uh, in Japan we produce 18 different appellations. So, some of our appellations were good, but maybe sometimes uh, I, firstly, I, I'm thinking about the Vonormanet Chaume which is a, a nice Premier Cru appellation in the Von Romane, but our vineyard is not perfectly located. And sometimes les chaumes um, need more sophistication. And for example, in 18, in 2018, 2019 and 2020, maybe thanks to the dry summer, this appellation um, take uh, more complexity, more sophistication. And I'm very proud of, of this appellation. Um, and in other vintages, I would be very happy about uh, the expression of the South Nuit Saint-Georges terroir we have, like Nuit Saint-Georges Premier Cru Roncière and Prullier, which is two very different um, wines. They are two neighbor, Roncière and Prullier are neighbor, but the expression of Roncière and Prullier are very different. Um, but of course, I, I love I love Les Beaumont uh, because even even if it's a, a difficult and a vintage, Les Beaumont will be always a beautiful appellation. So this is very complicated, but I think it depends on vintages, and I always very proud of uh, all the appellations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you didn't get one single uh, uh, wine. Uh, I'm trying to think if there was. Um, you know, one of the things that in an earlier period, um, it's easy to make great wine and make great vintage. But I remember the 1994s that um, uh, Etienne made in a vintage that everybody's long since forgotten, difficult. But for me, that was the one that put um, the domain on my personal map. Mm. I thought he uh, made some stunners. But you, you know, it's we, we, we don't have to lose that um, with my bro with my brother, yes, Hubert. We started to make wine in 2010, and we never produced, we, we never had to vinificate a difficult vintage. We, I think my generation uh, don't know uh, bad grapes. Of course, we, we had other difficulties like dry, dry summer, frost uh, during spring, hail, but we never had to make wines with um, grapes without a perfect maturity or big proportion of disease. And that's why we, we vintage after vintage, we have to be very focused and we, we always want to be a, a better vintage than the last one. Hmm. It's very important. Well, well, well. Can I ask you if climate change is a concern over like the last 20 years, it feels like picking used to be late September, now it's almost late August. Uh, uh, and, and at some point, will it become a challenge to get that right balance of phenolic maturity and, you know, just, just you, you won't be able to pick the right grapes one and then does it matter if your vineyards are high on the hills versus we were talking over Claude Michaud, the base, you know, closer to the closer to the road is better because you have more retained water. How much do you think as you think about the next 20 years? Is that a concern? It's true that the, the weather is, is, a, is the new big challenge of my gen generation. Um, I think at Domaine Grivo, we are very lucky because our vineyards, um, our clones, and also our work during the vegetative cycle give us the capacity to, to wait the perfect maturity of the skin. And these last few vintages, uh, warmer vintages, we, we could wait the perfect maturity of the skin. And we were not one of the first domains to start to pick the grapes. And we don't observe uh, high alcoholic degrees and less acidity balance. It's, it's quite complicated to, to explain because it's many things um, and it's a long time ago, but it's true that 18, 19, and 2020, we don't have huge alcoholic degrees. 
all the ones are between 13 and maybe 14 alcoholic degrees, so it's not too high for this kind of vintage. And we observe a concentration of the acid. So you have the complexity, you have, of course, a kind of richness, but carry by a huge energy thanks to a perfect balance of, uh, of the acid. And during the harvest, we are very focused on the evolution of the maturity of each terroir. And it's true that 10 years ago, we always pick the grapes in the same um, order. We start with the Bourgogne, then Grand Romaine Village, then the Saint Georges Village, Premier Cru, and, and, and at the end of the harvest, the Grand Cru. So it's true that we, we need to, to change a little bit the, the picking of the grapes, but it's, uh, we, 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 we know our vineyards, we, we work in the vineyard every day, so we can see if, the, if we observe some water stress in some vines, so we could pick the grapes here earlier or not, or we are very close of uh, all things in our vineyard. Until we have one question that we ask everyone that we speak with. If you could own one vineyard, which would it be? That you don't own. Uh, <laughs> you don't own. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> we are, we're, looking, we're looking out into the back garden of yes. Domain de la Romani Conti, I can tell you. So. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, can, can you show us? <laughs> Can you show us? Uh, not sure. How cool is that? How cool is that? Oh! Yeah, you oh. Can, you can see the rows of vines up there. That's the best thing I've ever seen. Yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty right, amazing. Let me change that because uh, uh, Matthew Lowe will be ruminating. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Is there a vineyard outside the village of Von Romane, Flashier, Is there a... uh, Maybe some Amoureux. I love the Amoureux. Amoureux. Yes. Oh, 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 white wine, why not? We produce only red, so not some, uh, some shadow from the oh, oh. So, so, Mathilde, why Amoureux and not Lusigny? Ah, that's, uh, you know, I, I, I don't try enough Lusini to maybe have the answer, but uh, I, I I love I love um, I love this the expression of this terroir. So um, that's why and, and because I, I I can't buy some Lusini, not Amoureuse also, but yes, Amoureuse is uh, one of my favorite terroir in Chambre. There we go. So. So you've got a few more treats in store, as I say, uh, at 1 2010 and 2 2007 Premier Cruise, all of which should be in a perfect place to drink. Yes. Fully minimal, I would reckon. Um, and then Eshiso 07. It'll be very interesting to compare the Sushio and the Eshiso in the same vintage again. Uh, if you have those side by side. Uh, yeah, and then 10, 9, 7, 0, and 1991, Richburg. A rare beast that 1991 because that was another frost vintage, so another short year. It's my brother vintage, also. So, okay. so drink to Uber when you taste that. Yes, wow, my very nice selection. So, uh, unless you have any last questions, um, we will leave you to enjoy your meal. Uh, thank you all for um, being with us, and thank you, Sebastian, who's shy and has disappeared. And have a great rest of the evening. And um, thank, you. Great, great you. thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy your dinner. Thank you. Thank you, Jasper. Thank you, Matilda. Thank you so thank much. You. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.